Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, we're here from the Arts Digital Lab at the University of Canterbury and we're going to be telling you about the Understanding Place project and the Red Zone Stories app that we've developed for that project. I'm Jennifer Middendorf, I'm the manager of the Arts Digital Lab and with me I've got Samuel Hope and Jennifer Rees who are our digital content analysts. So Samuel's going to be talking about some of the background to the project and the theoretical ground it comes out of. Jenny is going to be talking about the more technical aspects and how we actually built this app. And then finally, I'm going to tell you about some of the lessons we learned in the course of the project. So I'll hand over to Samuel now. Uh, kia ora koutou, nā mihi maha nā. Um, thanks NDF for inviting us to talk today. Um, so as Jennifer said, I'm one of the digital project specialists at the UC Arts Digital Lab alongside um, Jenny. Um, and we have been employed to work on a uh, National Science Challenge funded research project called um, Understanding Place. So Understanding Place um, is a part of building better homes, towns and cities, which is a, a small contestable fund that was um, uh, started up in, in October of last year and we'll be running through to um, June of 2019. Uh, so this particular challenge uh, uh, invites participants to respond to changing conditions in New Zealand's urban and built environments. Our project, Understanding Place, offers a cultural pers perspective on the issues presented by Christchurch's post-disaster uh, urban landscape. Many of these issues have been covered extensively in the media, for example, the loss, displacement, dislocation, fractured memory, both individual and collective, and we're in many ways focusing on an urban landscape which is characterised by a loss or an absence. We're focusing on landscapes that have been red zoned and houses have been removed from them. Um, so understanding place therefore seeks to develop approaches for capturing and representing multiple meanings and histories in these landscapes that have been abandoned or have had homes removed from them. Um, so I'll just give you, start off, um, talk about our research aims. Um, firstly, we want to capture regeneration narratives in red zone areas of Ōtutahi, Christchurch, in particular the residential red zone, which I'll describe in detail um, shortly. Um, in doing so, we want to present not not just one, but many stories or many narratives of quake effective spaces in the city and connect up what we've been calling micro stories. Um, as a part of this, we also want to foreground the stories of Māori and include the mana whenua story as a layer on a cultural map of the city. So we found the best way of, of approach of doing this was to build an app that people could take out into the field and use in situ, use in their spaces and explore them and use the app to record their stories. So I'll just play a little short video of us taking a early prototype of the app out into the field and describe a little bit about this space. So this is the residential red zone, which um, is probably not too familiar to people outside Christchurch, but you may have heard about it in the media. It's this kind of 630 hectare large, um, large space of land uh, which resides in the east of Christchurch. And in truth, there's not just one residential red zone, but many red zones. There's some on the Port Hills, which is on the um, Banks Peninsula, and some to the north of Christchurch as well. Um, this space once housed uh, over 5,000 residents. Um, there was, after the earthquakes in, in 2010 and 2011, there was a big push by um, Sierra, which is Canterbury Earthquake uh, Recovery Authority, to, to do something with this land because it had been severely damaged by the quakes and um, was considered red zoned and unable to be built on in the short to medium term. Um, so as of, I think, 2012, m there was a large project to start removing homes from this land. And in total, uh, the government bought, uh, purchased and removed uh, 5,422 uh, houses, which is, you'll see, you'll see the sort of traces of these spaces, um, and here's us testing it in the field at the moment. Um, so as part of this project, we, we linked up with some collaborators and partners. Um, one of them 
as a, for the funding um, uh, uh, set up by uh, National Science Challenge, we had to select a, a real, uh, real end user. And for, the, for us, that was Regenerate Christchurch, who are the successor to Sierra and, Christ, and uh, uh, Canary Earthquake Recovery Authority. And they've really taken hold over the planning and consultation over what is going to happen with this space in the next 10 years or so. Um, so alongside Regenerate Christchurch, we also um, sought out the Naitahu Research Centre, which is based at the University of Canterbury. Um, uh, Tamari To, who is the Ōpuku, or the leader of Naitua Huriri, which is the, the hapu and um, in, in which has mana whenua status in, in our part of Christchurch, they came on board with us and um, offered up their own story of this space. So we, we wanted to tell these multiple narr narratives of this, of this space and get as many different views as, as possible. And when we approached Tamari, we said, um, well, what, is, what are the Māori perspectives? How do we engage Māori in, to do this? And he said, well, there's not one single, um, uh, there's, not, there's not many Māori stories about this place necessarily, but there's the one hapu story, the one Naitua Huriri story. So we're just in the process of um, going through and getting a, uh, a, video, a video which will plot on this map and show throughout um, the residential red zone. So I'll just pass over to um, Jenny now, who's going to show you some, showcase the app a little bit and you'll get a sense of how it all fit together. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny. I am one of the team in the Arts Digital Lab UC as well. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the technologies behind the Red Zone Stories app and um, show you some screenshots. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of technical detail, so um, do feel free if that's your thing to come up and ask us more questions at the end. Um, but please do hold your questions till the end. Um, cool. Um, so Red Zone Stories is made up of two parts. There's the app that's primarily the data gathering tool and there'll be a website that goes with it that um, will be for storing and displaying the data. Um, the app is built using Ionic, which is an open source framework for building hybrid or cross-platform apps. Um, it describes itself as the dev-friendly app platform for building cross-platform apps with one code base for any device with the web. Um, building a hybrid app meant we could use our existing experience with website development and we didn't need to create and manage separate um, native code bases for Android and also iOS. Um, Ionic provided a lot of tools that helped speed up the development, such as um, being able to preview the app in a web browser as we built it, and to quickly deploy the app to real devices for testing as well. Um, it also comes with a library of front-end building blocks, such as buttons, form fields, page loading, spinners, all those things you expect to see in an app, so we didn't need to reinvent the wheel for the user interface. Um, we did need to extend Ionic with a few plugins to achieve some functionality, most importantly the um, accessing the device's camera and the GPS location data, which is critical to the project. Um, so once a user has used the app to record their story and submitted it, it's sent to the website side of Red Zone Stories. Um, the website is built using Drupal, also an open source project. Um, Drupal had the REST API tools we needed to have the app talk to the website, as well as being a user and content management system. Um, people can also will be able to submit their stories through the website if they can't make it to the Red Zone themselves. Um, once enough data has been collected, the website will display analytical and visualizations um, for the use of both researchers and for the general public who have been contributing. Uh, for the maps, which you'll see in a moment, um, we've used the Leaflet JavaScript library, along with Mapbox and data from OpenStreetMaps and Land Information New Zealand, some imagery layers that you'll see in a moment. Um, and we're capturing and displaying users' um, traces of their movements as they walk around the red zone using the GeoJSON format. I've just forgotten completely about the slides. I'll bring them up now. Cool. So that's um, Ionic on the left there, previewing how the homepage of the app looks on Android, iOS, and Windows. Um, and on the right, a sort of high-level architecture diagram of what's involved. Um, so this is the map as the main interface um, of the app. And when you're out in the red zone, you'll be able to toggle on the layers at the top there. Um, the one on the left there is from before the earthquakes, um, and the one on the right is from two or three years ago, the 2015-16 aerial, the, um, the red zone area marked out in the red. 
um, once you've logged in, um, you have the option to record a journey or a story. We've sort of been using both words interchangeably um, by hitting the button in the bottom left there. That's, um, it will check at that point that you're actually in or near the red zone and um, give the option to start flagging places, with a little flag icon, or take photos or record video. And at that point, once you're recording, it's also um, keeping track of where you're moving to, to draw a line of your movements on the map. Um, the flag option um, allows people just to say this place is important to me and to explain why, but they don't necessarily need to take a photo or upload a video. Um, and after taking a photo or a video or flagged a place is important, um, we're asking people to enter a little bit of metadata just to tell us why that's important, um, maybe what it is if they've taken a photo, and add some tags as well you can see on the right. Um, those are sort of a sample of the sort of things we expect people might might use, and those will come through in the um, analytical features that will come later on. Um, once you've finished recording your journey, you'll be able to have a look at all the things that you've recorded, maybe delete a photo or a video if you've had second thoughts about it. Um, and on the right there, if you've is uh, just a scrolled down view of the same page that shows recorded trace that's um, not in the red zone, it's at the university campus, but it gives you an idea of the kind of data that we'll be collecting of um, where people have walked or biked or driven um, while they've been wandering around. It gets a bit jagged closer to the buildings, I think, out in the open. Um, where the curved lines are, it gets a lot clearer. Well, um, and then people can upload to the website once they're happy with that. Yep, that's everything from me, thank you. So, all of this might have inspired you to maybe build your own app, because we've made it sound so easy. Well, I'm going to tell you about some of the challenges we faced along the way and the lessons we learnt. We definitely bit off way more than we could chew with this project. As Jenny said, building an app in Ionic is actually pretty easy for the basic stuff, but it was some of those details that got really hard. Jenny and Samuel have actually banned me from ever using the phrase, well in theory it shouldn't be too hard, because it always is. <laughs> Just one example, recording audio. You'd think that would be something really simple, especially on a phone, but it turns out that recording audio is really hard because every model of phone has a different built-in voice recorder. So what works on one phone is not going to work at all on another. There was a lot of problems like that. So a few months out from our proposed launch date, we were starting to panic. We had an ever-growing to-do list and the bugs just kept getting worse. And that's when we made what I think is the most important decision of this entire project, which was to admit we were in over our heads. <coughs> Admitting that let us stop trying to do the impossible, but instead pause for breath, step back, and look at the research aims of the project. And we asked ourselves, what's the minimum we could launch with and still meet those aims? So audio doesn't work. Well, video, ironically, is really easy to do. And it achieves the same aim of letting our participants tell their stories orally. So we scrapped audio altogether and we just stuck to video. And we did the same thing with all of our to-do lists. We went through and we divided it into the must-haves, the things that this app just wouldn't work without, and the nice-to-haves, which we put aside and said, we'll work on that later. We just concentrated all our effort on the must-haves. The other really big thing we decided to do was to bring in some external help. Getting our data from someone's phone into the database turned out to be difficult if we wanted to do it securely. We could do it, but there's a lot of security issues there about we don't want our participants or the university to be at risk of hacking or data loss. And we just couldn't figure out how to do that. So we decided to outsource that part because we couldn't put it on the nice to have list. The whole point of the project is collecting data, so we kind of had to do it. 
Now, we already had a really good relationship with Catalyst IT, and Jonathan's over in the corner there. And because they had worked on the Quake Studies project, which some of you might have heard us talk about that in previous years. So we went to Catalyst and we said, can you build the database side of this app, take that off our hands, and we'll carry on with all the other stuff. And that worked out really well. Now, of course, we were only able to do this because we had a budget for it. Right from the start, we budgeted in the possibility of needing external help. And that's probably the biggest lesson I want you to take away from here, is that when you're doing, taking on something totally new like this, plan to fail. Make sure that your budget and your deadlines can cope with things being a whole load harder than you expected them to be. Now, alongside the technical difficulties, we also had the usual practical problems that any big project has. Biggest of which was a key staff member left, which put us behind by several months while we, while we recruited a replacement for him. And that delay moved our launch date right into the middle of the time when Regenerate Christchurch would be doing their consultation on proposed uses for the Avon Otakaro River Corridor. Regenerate were understandably concerned that this might cause some confusion with the public if they had a consultation going on at the same time as we're gathering data on the same area. So they said to us, well, just postpone your launch until February. We couldn't do that because we actually have to start gathering our data now if we're going to meet the output deadlines that were set by the National Science Challenge. So our solution was to split our data gathering into two phases. In phase one, which starts this weekend, we are going out to community groups, to marae, to rest homes, places where we can get a group of participants together. We can go through the consent process and teach them how to use the app. And most importantly, we can make sure they're really clear about the difference between our project, which is research, and Regenerate's consultation. So that keeps Regenerate happy, and it also means we can start collecting data straight away. And it has the bonus that we can collect data from some key groups, like Maori and Pacifica, the elderly, people who might otherwise be underrepresented in our data. In February, we're going to launch phase two. In phase two, we'll release the app on the Google Play Store for free for anyone to download. You only better use it if you're in Christchurch, but anyone can download it. People can then just download, sign the online consent form, and go and start recording data. And we've got that extra little bit of time between now and February when we can start working on those nice-to-haves and maybe get a few of them back in there. So, would we recommend building your own app? Yes, but <laughs> be realistic about the size of the job you're taking on. Plan for failure, be prepared to scale back if you have to, and don't be ashamed if you need to ask for help. And I've done the same thing of forgetting which slide I'm on. Now, we're about to open up the floor for questions, but before we do, I'd just like to acknowledge um, Donald Matheson, who's the principal investigator on the Understanding Place project, and of course, the Be Building Better Homes, Towns and Cities National Science Challenge, say that three times fast, who are the funders of this project. Thank you. So we've got a roving microphone if anyone has any questions. Um, did you, I'm sorry, do any research prior to understand if an app was the best way to gather these stories and if audiences would actually want to use an app? Yeah, yeah. so there was a, a bit of initial research um, which mainly was just compiling of everything that was out there. We used um, 
uh, uh, we looked at a few key texts. One of them was uh, Hypercities, which is this text by a couple of digital humanities scholars um, out of Harvard, and they they had done a project prior, which was cultural maps of um, various different cities. Like uh, there's one in the Philippines, so there's the old cult, uh, heritage uh, sector in the Philippines, and they looked at how um, different people engage with those platforms. So we, we looked to these sort of cultural mapping projects coming out of universities. Um, we also looked at uh, what's called volunteer geographic surveys. So these are often uh, uh, run by sort of uh, urban developers or government organisations to try and uh, extract um, uh, data from, from citizens about what they think about certain developments in the city. And the third thing was looking at um, sort of participatory archival practice. So um, there's this text called uh, uh, Archive Everything, Mapping the Everyday, which came out a couple of years ago by um, Gabriella Giannacci, and she talks about Archives 3.0, which is this kind of participatory, reflexive, user-generated kind of archive where people are describing things themselves and, and really curating the archive in a way that's meaningful to them. So our, our project sort of sits in between these different things, the kind of thick, or the cultural mapping, the um, volunteered, volunteered geographic survey and the, the, the participatory archive. And, and the app side of things is we wrestled with all sorts of um, accessibility problems and I don't think it's ever going to be perfect. I mean, there's lots of people, but currently this is only an Android version, so um, <coughs> we're, we're going to roll out a, an Apple version early next year, but the, there's, so there's technological um, issues there, but also the, we want to reach different generations as well and that's obviously going to, going to be a problem as we go out to, to community groups and some of them will have higher digital literacy, some won't. So, so that's why we've sort of done this stage as well, where we'll go out and sit down with the with communities and sort of walk them through it. Um, I, I don't know if we mentioned there's also a website version as well. So, so that's um, for people that don't have or are not in Christchurch have moved elsewhere. They can contribute it, to it that way. I think the other key thing about using an app is that it lets us really pinpoint where the important, because this is, as Samuel said, a massive area of land. And so by using the app and people having to actually move through that space, we can see where the important places are. And that's something that's not easily measured by just saying, you know, where do you think is important? It's, you, you get more of a sense of that from people actually going out into the space and how they move through that space. Um, what sort of repository do you envisage this being housed in in the future and um, what sort of systems have, are in place in terms of technology updates and that sort of thing to keep it from becoming obsolete? Right, at the moment and for the first probably two years of its life it's going to sit in that Drupal repository and Catalyst are providing some support to us to make sure that that's going to keep updated. At the end of the life of the project, we're going to transfer everything over into Quake Studies, so it will then be available in Quake Studies and Seismic and in uh, Digital New Zealand. So, yeah. Anyone else? Um, I also forget to mention that um, Jenny has a version of the app on her tablet which works in Wellington. So it's a special demo version. So if anyone wants to have a look at what it actually looks like in practice, um, just talk to Jenny later. Yeah. 